Today I'm going to share with you how to make a strawberry jam without pectin. And I'm going to show you how to make a low sugar version and a sugar free version. And at that point, you can put them in the refrigerator. But if you want to take it one step further, I'm going to show you how to water bath can your jam to make it shelf stable. Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary, and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel, and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Making homemade strawberry jam without pectin, whether it's store-bought pectin or homemade pectin, can actually be very easy to do. You really don't need pectin. It's not something often that our grandmothers who made homemade jam frequently had. So there's just a few little tips and tricks that you need to master in order to get your homemade jam without pectin to set up, as they say, to gel correctly. And we'll go over that as we cook the jam, but first let's go over all the ingredients that we're going to need. You're going to want approximately five cups of crushed strawberries. And this is anywhere from maybe eight to ten cups of whole strawberries. It really depends on the size of the strawberries. And if you're uh, buying it in these little clamshell one pound packages, you're probably going to need, you know, two and a half to three of these packages. But it's not an exact science, so don't worry if you have a little under five cups crushed or a little over five cups of crushed strawberries. And you have options on how you want to crush these. You can use a potato masher. You can uh, crush them with a fork, as maybe you've seen me do in previous jam making videos. Uh, or you can whirl them in a food processor. Uh, if you whirl them in the food processor, just make sure you don't create a big mush. You do want them to have some body to them and a, li a little bit of chunkiness. The next thing that you're going to need is the juice of three lemons. And again, don't worry if it, you know, it's not an exact science. These lemons were about this size, pretty good sized lemons. And with three of these, I got a half a cup of juice. And that's just about what you want. The three lemons should yield you about a half a cup of lemon juice. Oh, and I just want to mention, don't worry about writing any of this down. Uh, if you open the description under this video, uh, look for the word recipe, and then next to that will be a link. That'll take you over to my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel. And you'll be able to see the recipe online. You can read it online or you can print it out. Now, in addition to the juice, you also want to save the, uh, the lemons after you've juiced them. And the reason that we're using the lemon juice is that this is very helpful in place of when you don't have pectin. The lemon juice has pectin in it and it will help your uh, jam set up. And the reason that we want to add in the peels as well, which will, will uh, the rinds, will, which will fish out after we're done cooking the jam, is that these are also rich in pectin. Especially the white part, especially the pith, what's known as the pith. And when making jam with no pectin, and you're going to be relying on the pectin in your citrus, in this case lemons, the thicker skinned citrus the better. And the reason is, as I had mentioned, the pith is high in pectin. So the more pith you have, the more pectin you have. Next, for the low sugar version of strawberry jam, you're going to want three cups of sugar. And this is just a white cane sugar. Uh, it is organic, so it's unbleached, but it's three cups. If you were doing the full-blown, full sugar jam, it'd be six cups of sugar. But I find that I have never really liked making full sugar jam. I find three cups of sugar makes it plenty sweet, yet still allowing the flavor of the fruit to really come through. Now, to do the sugar-free version, if you want to use stevia, you'll use for this amount of strawberries, we've got five cups crushed, you're going to want to use one quarter teaspoon of the liquid stevia up to one half teaspoon of stevia. 
I would recommend mixing the liquid in at this point in your strawberries and tasting it at one quarter teaspoon and see if it's sweet, sweet enough to your liking. If not, move up to the half teaspoon. Now, if you're using a sweetener like say monk fruit, then what you'll want to do is look at the directions or, or the equivalencies, so to speak, on the package of your alternative sweetener and see what the one-to-one -one ratio is in place of sugar, traditional sugar. So if, for example, monk fruit was one-to-one, -one, I don't know if it is, I don't use monk fruit, I would, I'd be more inclined to use the stevia. But if you did use monk fruit and they said it was one-to-one, -one, then you'd want three cups of monk fruit. But if it were considerably less, then you would just adjust the amount accordingly. Now, another option is that you can make this completely sugar-free, whether it's white sugar or, or an alternative sweetener. You can make jam with no sugar or no uh, alternative sweetener at all. And I have a recipe where I show you how to do that, and I'll be sure to link to it in the iCards uh, and in the description below. Uh, but just for a little uh, brief overview, what you do in place of using some type of sugar or alternative sweetener is if you do want it to have some sweetness in addition to the fruit that you're using, you add to this about to this amount of strawberries, you add one cup of, of mild flavored juice and a mild colored juice so it doesn't distort the color of the strawberries. So you'd use like a white grape juice or you would use a uh, apple juice, something like that would work very well. However, if you wanna leave it completely out, you can, and all you would be adding in the sugar-free, the completely sugar-free and sh sweetener-free <laughs> jam would be uh, to just add a cup of water in place of the juice and also in place of any type of bulk sweetener like this, like a sugar that you'd be using. But that no sugar jam in the previous video is using pectin. And so I really wanted to address how to make a jam whether with low sugar or with an alternative sweetener, some sugar-free sweetener like a, sweet, like a stevia or other alternative without pectin. So that's what we're addressing here. Now, after we make this jam, you can put it in jars and go ahead and put it in your refrigerator. And we're gonna probably get about six eight ounce jars or eight ounces is a half pint canning size jar, typical sort of jam or jelly size jar. And you can go ahead and put that in your refrigerator and it'll last definitely for a couple of months. However, if you want to water bath can your jam, that's what I'm going to walk you through step by step. Now, we have to prepare everything for the water bath canning before we even make the jam. So I'm going to put the timestamps in the description below and also in the pinned comment. So if you just want to go ahead and skip over the water bath canning preparation and just start to make the jam, you can look at the timestamp and you can just jump ahead. Now to water bath can your jam, the first thing that you're gonna need is something to water bath can in. Now I have an electric water bath canner here, but you don't need this. It, you can also have one of those, uh, they often look like speckled enamel and they'll sell them at the grocery store or the big box stores and they're water bath canners and they go right on your stove top. But they do have a concave bottom, so you have to check with the manufacturer of your stove to make sure it's safe to put that type of canner on your stove top. Uh, if you have a glass stove top like me, it's recommended not to use that type of canner because it can make a suction and it can potentially crack your glass top uh, stove. So you definitely want to check with your manufacturer. Now, there are other stove top water bath canners that are made that have a flat bottom. They're often made from stain. They just look like a big stainless steel stock pot. And so in that vein, you can also just use a stock pot. The only thing that you're going to need is if you use a stock pot, you're going to need some type of rack that you can put in the bottom. And it can be, you know, a cake cooling rack that you have. And basically this is the rack that comes with my um, 
electric water bath canner. So you're just looking for something like this, you know, that you might cool cookies on, whatever the case may be that can fit down into your stock pot. Now don't worry if you don't have something like that. There is another alternative. You can take your canning rings and you can start looping them together uh, with a little kitchen twine or some twist ties and you just keep going around until you basically have them all looped together, one in the middle and then all around, and you can make your own rack. And it's very easy to do. And then you can lower that down into your stock pot and you're all set. You've got a water bath canner. Next, you're gonna need canning jars. And in the case of this strawberry, strawberry jam, we're making six eight ounce jars. These are pint size canning jars. And they're, the eight ounce ones come in different sizes. They, some are very cute. Uh, they're a little, a little more rounded and whatnot. Any, any canning jar of that type that's made for eight, to hold eight ounces of jam is perfect. And then if you're buying your uh, canning jars, you know, in, in the box that they normally come in, usually a set of 12, they'll come with the rings and they'll come, or sometimes they're called bands, and they'll come with the lids. And if not, the, uh, you'll want to make sure that you definitely buy bands and lids in case you've just got jars. And then once you have bands, the nice thing, or rings, the nice thing about them is these, these can be reused. However, you always need new lids because the lid has a little uh, like button or a little raised button on top. And when you use these to water bath can, that button is going to become depressed and that's what's going to make a nice, that's going to tell you you've got a nice tight seal, a nice airtight seal. And then once you open your jam and remove this lid, it's then spent. You can't use it again. It won't properly reseal again. Now you want to make sure that all of your jars, your bands, and your lids have been washed in warm soapy water, rinsed well, and left to dry, and kept very clean while you're waiting to fill them with the hot jam. Now we're going to be going ahead and putting these into our canner and just letting them simmer in hot water, which is going to make them nice and hot and be ready to receive the hot jam. But you do want to just have them washed up uh, before you even begin that process. And I want to mention a word about these lids. They have a little uh, sort of rubber seal all around the outer ring here. And you do not want to boil these lids. You can put them in a little hot water, maybe for you know 30 seconds if you're concerned about wanting to sterilize them. But it's no longer recommended to keep them in hot water for a long time or to uh, boil them. You definitely don't want to boil them. And the reason is it can loosen this seal or damage it. And then what happens is when it needs to make the seal on the jar, it, it's damaged and so it doesn't make a good tight seal. So that's a good tip to know. Do not, do not boil these or let these get too hot. Just keep them, you know, wash them in hot soapy water, rinse them well, let them air dry and keep them nice and clean while they're waiting to be used for your canning jars. Next, you're gonna to wanna to have a little bowl of some white vinegar and a clean paper towel or a clean cloth, whatever you have. And the reason is this is what we're going to use to clean the top of our jars to make sure there's nothing sticky on them, no jam or anything like that after we've poured in our hot jam. Uh, so that this way, when we go to put our lid on, it's gonna make a nice clean seal. Next, I wanna go over the supplies that you're gonna need in order to go through the whole water bath canning process. And the first thing that you're gonna need is some type of jar lifter. And why we need this is to put our jars in and take them out of the canner. Now what you're gonna do with your jars is, you see your jar lifter can really grip this nicely. And as I said, we're gonna put these down into the water and we're just going to submerge them. They're gonna be filled with water. I have water in here. I'll take a picture uh, so that you can see. And one thing I wanna mention, as you're picking up your jars, you probably wanna take your finger, or even with, I know there's no crack on the top of this, so I'm not too worried, but taking a little paper towel and just running your finger 
over the top with maybe the paper towel to protect it in case there is a crack or a chip. Just run your finger over the jar to make sure that the jar that you are submerging down into your canner that's going to be waiting for you to fill it with jam uh, isn't chipped. And then, you know, just give your jar a good look once over, so to speak, to make sure there are no cracks. And so then we'll go ahead and we'll lower this one down into our canner. Now I've got six jars submerged in there, but I'm going to go ahead and put in my seventh jar because technically this recipe does make six eight ounce jars, but I always like to have one extra jar handy because whenever you're working with fresh fruit, it's not an exact science and it's always good to have an extra jar on hand. Now, it may not give you enough to, to fill your jar and then water bath can it, but at least it's ready there for you to put your hot jam in and refrigerate. Next, you need some type of ladle, and any ladle will do. I like this one because it has a little hook here on the end that uh, is nice to be able to hook on the side of your pot as you're ladling in your jam, you know, in between filling jars so that it doesn't fall in and become completely submerged. But any ladle will do. Next, you're gonna want some type of funnel. And again, any funnel you have that can fit over, my canning jars are in there now, that can fit over a canning jar will work perfectly. And these are just regular mouth. The eight ounce jelly jars are just regular mouth uh, jars. There are also wide mouth jars. And generally your funnel will work with whatever funnel that you have should work with a regular size mouth jars or wide mouth jars. And what's nice about this funnel is it has markings here for headspace. And headspace is very important when you're canning. Different foods require different headspace. And in the case of jam, you need to leave a quarter headspace at the top of your jar. So in like for pickles, it's a half, a half inch headspace and so on and so forth. And so having this Mar these markings here on your funnel are very handy because as you're ladling in your jam and you see it get up to that quarter inch mark, then you know you've got the right amount of headspace. So that's a very clever thing, but you know, again, any funnel will work. Next, you need some type of debubbler. Now don't worry, you don't need any special tool really. Uh, these will often come uh, when you buy a canning set with all this canning equipment in it. And I'll be sure to put links to all this stuff in the description below, uh, but definitely check your grocery store and your big box stores, uh, especially in the summer months. Uh, they often uh, sell all of this canning equipment. Basically, all a debubbler is used for is to just kind of go around in your jar and loosen any air bubbles. And when the air bubbles are loosened, it may lower your headspace and then you may have to add in a little bit of uh, additional jam or whatever you're canning. And this debubbler is actually very clever because it's marked with the headspace markings. Uh, one quarter inch, one half inch, three quarters inch, one inch. So uh, this you just put in your jar and I'll show you how to, how to use this when we can up our strawberry jam. But this is a very clever debubbler. But again, a, a knife will work fine too. And if you have a funnel that doesn't have markings on it and you don't, uh, and your debubbler doesn't have markings on it, don't worry. You can always take a ruler, but you know, just don't put it into your jam because uh, you don't know if it's food safe or not. But you can measure from the outside uh, and to, to see if you've got the right headspace. So that always, that always can be used in a pinch. Next, the final piece of equipment that you're gonna need is this little magnetized uh, lifter. And basically all this is used for is to just help you pick up your canning lid so that you don't have to touch it too much and potentially contaminate it with any germs because that's the, uh, the real secret, so to speak, to successful canning to make sure that your food does stay very fresh is that everything stays very clean and that you don't introduce any bad bacteria uh, into your jars. So this, you can just put this down on your jar and then you position it and then you pull your magnet off and you're all set. And all these things are sold separately. So if you have some and you don't have others, um, it's very easy to get. And these type of things are very reasonable. Uh, but they also are sold in kits if you're completely new to canning and you're just starting out and you need everything. And the nice thing about the kits is they're often usually uh, more reasonably priced than having to buy everything individually. 
And then you're also going to want some type of cushioned area that you can put your jars on when you take them out of your canner. It can just be a couple of folded dish towels or if you have one of these uh, drying mats that have some cushion to them, these work great too. Now to make jam, with, especially without pectin, you're going to want a nice big pot and one that has high sides because we've got to bring this up to a boil. And when you boil jam, it tends to splatter. So the higher sided uh, pot you have, the better. So now we'll just go ahead and add in our crushed strawberries, our five cups of crushed strawberries, smells wonderful. And then we'll add the rest of the ingredients. Then next to our crushed strawberries that are in our pot, we want to go ahead and add in our lemon juice. And we'll just give that a twizzle around. Now that we've got the lemon juice mixed in with the strawberries, we're going to go ahead and add in our sugar for the low sugar version. Now, if you are using your monk fruit or something else like that, this is the time you'd go ahead and stir it in as well. If you've already tried to sweeten your strawberries a little earlier using the liquid stevia uh, and you tasted them and you liked the flavor, uh, you can always check them again now that you've added the lemon juice and add a little more stevia, or you can wait until this point to add the stevia. It's really up to you. Now one thing I want to mention, if at this point you don't want to add any sweetener. You don't want to add any sugar. You don't want to add any stevia or other alternative sweetener, you know, a low calorie or a zero calorie sweetener, a sugar-free sweetener. You can make the jam without any of that. However, because we have to use so much lemon juice uh, to help us with the fact that we don't have any pectin, it can make a rather tart or tangy jam, as opposed to if you're doing a completely no sugar jam, no alternative sugar, no real sugar jam, and you're making it with pectin, you're not adding, you're adding a little bit of lemon juice, but not a lot. And so, and that's really, it is to help with the flavor, uh, to really bring out the flavor of the strawberries, but you're using a very small amount. And so, I really recommend that if you want a completely unsweetened jam, that it does make more sense to make one with pectin. Although you can try this, but I just want to give you a heads up that you may uh, find it a little tangy. Now, as an alternative, you know, I always have a lot of alternatives. You can omit the lemon juice and you can use maybe a grated apple, uh, especially a green apple or a crab apple, they're very high in pectin. However, you are going to be changing the texture of strawberry jam by adding in uh, a grated apple or a grated crab apple. And often just one apple may not give you enough pectin to give you a good gel to have your jam really set up nicely. Because I know I've heard from a lot of you when you try to make these uh, no pectin jams that they tend to be very watery. And that's often because the recipes don't call for enough uh, pectin, you know, natural pectin in a sense, in terms of lemon juice. And so, that's often why your jam is not gelling or setting up nicely. And often one apple or maybe two small crab apples really isn't giving you enough pectin either. So for the five cups of strawberries, you really do need the uh, half a cup of lemon juice. And so just on its own, this jam would be a little tart. But in any event, now we'll go in and add our three cups of sugar and we'll stir this around to get it all blended with our strawberries. Now, once you get all that sugar stirred in and it'll start to dissolve, you're going to want to go ahead and now finally add in your lemons. And these, as I said, are just the rinds that are left over after you've juiced, uh, juiced them well. And then once we get that, in, we'll just twizzle those around. Now we will be fishing these out when we're done with the jam, but in the interim we're just going to give them a good mixing so they're nicely submerged with our jam, our jam in the making. 
Now another option, if you don't want to necessarily have these floating around in your jam, I find this works really well, but another option is you can put all of this stuff tied up in cheesecloth or a little, uh, if you've got a little scrap of a um, flour sack towel, what we use when we're straining bone broth and whatnot, uh, you can make a little pouch and you can put these um, lemon rinds in there and uh, maybe along with some of the pulp that you had left over. Uh, you can also put the seeds in there. The seeds are rich in pectin. Now everyone has a little different feeling about the seeds because sometimes seeds of different fruits can contain some toxins. Now in a small amount it's not going to hurt anybody but in a large amount yes they, they could be considered poisonous. Although lemon seeds are kind of low on that, uh, on that scale in terms of toxins that they may contain. But I don't put the pits in um, and I don't really add uh, any of the pulp. I didn't really, I had a lot of juice and, and it, I also had a lot of seeds and so I didn't, and there wasn't really that much pulp and so I didn't feel like fishing out all the seeds just for the tiny little bit of pulp that I had. Uh, so I, but I find just putting these lemons right in, they're going to really soften. I feel that's going to really help um, that pectin be released from that nice thick pith that we have on these particular lemons and it's going to really help our uh, jam to gel up nicely. So I just do it like this. I just find it easier. Now, before we bring this over to the stove, what you want to do is take a plate and put this in your freezer because we're going to use this plate to do what's known as the gel test. Alrighty, now with that plate in my freezer, we're, I'm going to bring you over to my stove and we're going to go ahead and bring this up to a boil. Now, what you want to do is you want it to reach 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what if you don't have a thermometer, in like a candy thermometer? Chances are, I don't think my mother, when she would make jam like this, ever had a candy thermometer and I definitely know my grandmother didn't. So how do you know if you've got it up to the right temperature? Well, what you're going to look for is a really good rolling boil that you cannot, my ice maker, <laughs> that you cannot stir down. And you're going to be stirring it and you're not going to be able to stir down that boil. And chances are that's 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, here is the tip to make sure your jam without pectin gels up nicely. Many people will take it off the stove once it hits that rolling boil, maybe let it go for a minute, and then they'll remove it from the stove. And then they may not do the gel test and they jar it up and then they're not really happy with the contents. The secret is we're going to turn this down from that hard rolling boil to more of a simmer. And we're going to let it simmer for about 15 minutes. And that's the secret where some of the moisture is going to evaporate from our jam and then I'm confident we're going to get a good set up, a good gel. Alrighty, let's get this over to the stove and bring it up to a boil. Well, I brought our strawberries up to a hard ro rolling boil that I couldn't stir down and then I let it boil like that for about a minute. Then I turned it down to a medium and I let it continue to simmer, oh, you know, with some bubbling, but not that hard boil that I couldn't turn, that I couldn't uh, uh, stir down. But instead, just let it simmer like that for about 15 to 20 minutes. Now, during this process, you may see some foam develop, but don't worry you can skim that foam off or you can put a little uh, dollop, so to speak, of butter. And you really don't need anything more than maybe a teaspoon or even a little less. And you'll just put that right into your jam and after about a minute or so you'll notice that the foam will really calm down. Then after the jam has simmered for about 15 or 20 minutes, now I've taken it off the heat and the first thing that we're going to do is do our gel test. So we go ahead and get our plate out of the freezer, get a clean spoon 
And all you need to take is about a teaspoon of your jam and just pour it in the middle of the plate and just give it a minute to cool off. Now, after you give it about a minute to cool, you're gonna take your finger and you're just gonna run it up through the jam. And if it stays separated, you've got a good gel. Now, there are other tests to tell if you've got a good gel in your jam that involve taking some, uh, lifting some up out of the pan with a spoon and letting it drip down. And if it drips and drips, then it's not gelled. It needs to sort of come off the spoon in more of a complete sheet. And, but I find that can be kind of difficult to tell 100% if you've got it exactly right. Uh, so I always find just doing this test on a cold plate works really well. And another option you can do if you just want to put a spoon in your freezer, you can do the same thing where you've got your cold spoon out of your freezer, dip it down into your jam, and then just go use your finger, uh, let it cool a little bit, and then use your finger down the back of the spoon and see if it stays separated. But if it stays separated like this, you're all set. You've got a good gel. Now I've got clean tongs here and a bowl and what I'm going to do is I just lift out uh, my lemon rinds and I just give them a good squeeze to make sure I get any jam out of them. They're quite soft after having simmered in the, in the jam for those 15 to 20 minutes. And I'm just going to continue doing that until I get all the rinds out. Now at this point, if you're not water bath canning your jam, you can just go ahead, put it in your jars, whatever jars you're using. You don't necessarily need canning jars. If you have recycled jars, that's fine too. Just something that has a, has a lid on it. And then you can go ahead and put it in your refrigerator and you're all set, you're done. But if you want a water bath can, then the next step is to get your jar lifter and remove the lid from your canner going to go put that ah, <laughs> over there and then you're going to lift out your jars and now I've had these simmering in my water bath canner in hot water so they're nice and hot and then we're just going to put them on the cushioned surface and as I saw as you saw me do you, you empty out the water and then you're going to want to get your your funnel and you're just going to want to put that on the top of your jar. Then you're going to want to get your ladle and you're going to want to start ladling your uh, wonderful jam into your jar. Then you're going to want to take your debubbler once you get it filled within that to that one quarter inch headspace and you just want to go around your jar a little just making sure that there are no air bubbles in there. Then after you've done the debubbling and you may want to check to see if your headspace has decreased any and then you can use your headspace tool now if you don't have one you can just use a um, wait, ruler i didn't think of the word ruler on the outside of your jar but as i said that we need a quarter inch headspace and so i'm just going to use the quarter inch headspace measure on this to bubbler and you'll see that looks perfect i'll take a close-up picture so you can see it now that you've got your quarter inch headspace, you're all set to take your paper towel or a clean cloth, whatever you have, dip it in your vinegar, and then just go around your lid to clean it, to make sure that there's no jam or anything sticky. And you see, it was important that I clean this lid because this now will guarantee that we'll get a nice good seal. Now we use our little magnet tool to pick up our lid and put it on top of our nice clean jar. Next, you just wanna take your ring and you wanna put it onto your jar, you may call it a band or a ring, and you just wanna put seal it to where it's fingertip tight. And I'm gonna take up a close-up a close video so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You don't want any brute force. And the reason is the ring only serves the purpose of holding the lid in place during the water bath canning process and you don't want it to be super tight because you want to allow a little bit of air to escape from underneath the canning lid. And that way, during the water bath canning process, as that, as that air escapes, if the ring was really tight, the air wouldn't be able to escape and under pressure, it could cause the jar to break 
and it really wouldn't make a good seal once you removed it from the water bath canner because there would be air in the jar. So even though the jar would seal from the change in temperature and you hear the ping and all of that, there'd still be some air in there. And so air is the enemy of a good canned, uh, of a good canned, canned good <laughs> because it will, uh, you know, cause, potentially cause the development of bacteria and so on and so forth. So you don't want to have that ring brute force tight. You just want fingertip tight. You let some air release. That way when you take your jar out of the canner and the change in temperature causes the lid to seal and create the ping, there's no air inside of that jar. And that's what keeps the food fresh and allows you to have it be shelf stable. So. Remember, no brute force. All you're going to do, and as I said, I'll take a video and overlay it so you can see, is to put your ring on and then simply turn it until you meet some resistance. You turn it very gently and you meet some resistance. Once you meet some resistance, then just give it another little gentle turn. And that's it. That's what's called fingertip tight. Now we're going to take our jar lifter and we're going to lower our first jar down into the hot water of our water bath canner. And then we're going to get our second empty jar out of the water bath canner, empty the water, bring it on out to our cushioned surface, and I'll go through the same process of filling all the rest of my jars, and then I'll show you how we're going to go about the water bath canning process. I've got all my jars filled and in my water bath canner and you want to have at least an inch or two on covering your jars. So an inch or two above the top of your jars. So I'm just going to add, I'm starting to bring this up to a boil and I'm just going to add some hot water from my tea kettle because I just want to make sure that I have enough water covering all the jars by about an inch or two. I like to do about two inches. Alrighty, that looks perfect. And I'll overlay a picture so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to go ahead and put my lid on. And then I'm going to bring this up to a boil. And we're going to process this, boil it, process it for 10 minutes. Well, I processed my jars for 10 minutes. And that means, you know, at a rapid boil. And now I've turned my water bath canner off and I'm just going to let the jars rest in there for five minutes. And I'm going to take the lid off, but when you do this, regardless of what type of canner you're using, just open it away from you because see, a lot of steam tends to come out. So I let those sit in the hot water for five minutes after turning off the water bath canner. Now we're just going to start removing our jars and we want to keep them very straight. We just want to lift them right out and onto our cushion surface. And then we'll just go get our next jar. Again, keeping it very straight. And there we go. Perfect. And oh, the ping! <laughs> now we're going to leave these jars like this for 24 hours. And then after 24 hours, making you want to make sure that each jar has sealed. Some will ping very quickly, like, uh, oh, there's another one. <laughs> uh, sometimes they'll ping very quickly, but you do want to give them a 24 hours and then make sure that all of those little raised button areas, I'll take a picture and overlay it so you can see what I'm talking about. Oh, that one just pinged as I was talk <laughs> talking about it. Um, but it will, from being raised, it'll depress down uh, or almost look flat. And then you'll know you have a good seal. And as long as you can't see the raised button anymore, everybody's good. So what you want to do at that point, after the 24 hours, is you want to remove the rings. And the reason that you want to remove the rings, or the bands as you may call them, is because if you keep the rings on, and for any reason, over time, the seal fails. And these seals, according to the ball company, these lids 
uh, will keep your food sealed for and, and good for 18 months. It used to be a year, now they say 18 months. But I know some home canners will say even longer, so that's totally up to you. But after you remove, if you were to leave the ring on and the seal for some reason broke, maybe some extreme temperature change, or there's all various reasons these things can happen. What would happen is the ring would cause the lid to reseal, and that would be a false seal. So your food in there would no longer be fresh. Mold could develop, so on and so forth. Bad bacteria could develop. So you want to remove the rings after the 24 hour period. Now I put a little jam in here that I reserved from when I was uh, canning the other jars. And I just wanted to show you this lovely consistency. Well, I just love the consistency of this jam. And to think that it's made without store-bought pectin is wonderful. Well, let's give it a taste. Mmm. Oh, that is delicious. The strawberries really come through, the flavor of the strawberries, a little bit of lemon, a little bit of sweetness. I think you're gonna really love this. And I hope that you'll give this a try because you can make homemade jam without pectin and you can be con uh, successful in getting a good consistency. Now, if you would like to learn more about water bath canning, how to make more types of jam, how to make, a t how to can tomatoes, how to can pickles, bread and butter pickles that are exceptionally delicious, be sure to check out this video over here where I show you all that and more. And it's all step-by-step -step water bath canning in detail. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country Kitchen. Love and God bless.